Oh, yes. Excellent. Um, oh, great. A lot of people coming in. Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to pause for just a moment to let everybody in the Zoom room. We're so happy you're here tonight. Welcome. Welcome to all our attendees. Madeline, I see somebody sharing your last name. I think your family member made it in. I think there's a couple of them, but yeah. Good. Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Glad to see him. Definitely. Definitely. Awesome. Hi to everybody just joining. We're going to wait a couple mo uh, moments for everybody to join the Zoom room and then we'll get started. Awesome. We're filling up quickly tonight. This is good. Okay. I think it's ready. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Politics and Prose Live. My name is Beth Wong. I'm on the events team at PNP, and we thank you so much for joining us here tonight to celebrate Madeline Ostrander's new book, At Home on an Unruly Planet, in conversation with Dr. Laura Helmuth. At any time during the event tonight, you can click on the link that I'm going to keep posting in the chat to purchase copies of this new book from PNP. In addition to growing your library, a book sale from PNP means that we're able to keep bringing content like this to, uh, to our community, um, which we absolutely love doing. You can ask our author a question tonight by submitting it into the Q&A box, the button for which can be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, be sure to submit your question in the Q&A box and not in the chat so that we'll be sure that our um, moderator and our author both see it. Um, that is all the logistics. I will waste no more time in getting to the main event. Um, in At Home on an Unruly Planet, science journalist Madeline Ostrander reflects on the climate crisis not as an abstract scientific or political problem, but as a palpable force that is now affecting all of us at home. Ostrander pairs deeply reported stories of hard-won optimism with lyrical essays on the strengths we need in an era of crisis. The book is required reading for anyone who wants to make a home in the 21st century. Madeline Ostrander is a science journalist and writer whose work has appeared in NewYorker.com, The Nation, Sierra Magazine, PBS's Nova Next, Slate, and numerous other outlets. Her reporting on climate change and environmental justice has taken her to locations such as the Alaskan, Ar uh, Alaskan Arctic and Australian Outback. Ostrander will be in conversation tonight with Dr. Laura Helmuth, the current editor-in-chief of Scientific American and formerly the health, science, and environment editor for the Washington Post. Welcome to you both. The floor is all yours. Thank you Great. so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Thanks for your attention to this really important, wonderful new book. And thank you for caring about the climate emergency, climate change, climate science, and how we're going to have to live with it and learn to live with it. And um, so yeah, th this book, I just to, to be straight from the very beginning, this is wonderful. You're going to love reading it. I know sometimes, um, you know, reading about climate change can feel unremittingly grim or terrifying. And uh, this this book is completely realistic, and yet it's very hopeful and evocative and inspiring. Um, you know, Madeline's a lovely writer and uh, great reporter, and she's really making sense of some of the chaos of climate emergency uh, in in very uh, with very specific things, very specific missions, and and really interesting people who are uh, kind of facing it with with resilience and creativity and a lot of a lot of strength. And um, I think you'll you'll enjoy getting to know these people. And so I'll turn it over to Madeline to start. With um, with you know giving us kind of an introduction to one of the one of the main one of the uh, main people who is kind of our guide to what's happening, especially in coastal cities in the United States. So um, I'm not going to read. I'm going to show you the book. Um, oh, I have the screen and it's funny. But anyway, here's the book. <laughs> and um, but I'm not going to read straight out of it because um, I I um, sort of abridged what I'm going to read so that you can have more of a taste of the character, that person who um, I profiled and, and interviewed and talked to. Um, so I'm going to read off, off a piece of paper here. But um, but uh, yeah, the, um, the cover, just so you know, it has um, some original art done by a visual artist in Washington state who has herself lived in an area that's gone through a lot of catastrophic wildfires. Um, so. Yeah, the cover also is really connected to the, what's inside. Um, 
in any case, um, so this is a story out of St. Augustine, Florida, which is the oldest continuously occupied European settled city in the country. So it, like Washington, DC, it's one of the most historic places in the country. And um, St. Augustine is also, like so many other coastal cities, really vulnerable to flooding and to sea level rise and also to now to hurricanes. Um, they're on a part of the Florida coast that hasn't historically experienced as many hurricanes, but they went through some pretty catastrophic flooding during Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Ida. And there are people who live and work there who are really passionate about protecting this place and about historic preservation. And so I followed some of the journey of those people, both as professionals, but also as just normal humans who are living in this place that's going through crisis and are trying to figure out what to do. So this is about Jenny Wolf, who's the local, who was, um, she's since gone on to other things, but she, at the time, she was the historic preservation officer for the city, and she also lived there. Um, <clears throat> in 2011, when Jenny Wolf was hired as the historic preservation officer of the city of St. Augustine, she didn't think she would be planning for floods and storms. By disposition, Jenny is an organized person, in appearance fine-boned with long blonde hair and a heart-shaped face, in dress and manner neat but not ostentatious, with a formal way of speaking, especially about her work. But her feelings about her new job and home would eventually go far beyond formality. It was an overwhelming but rewarding job, and she would grow to love this storied place Established in the 16th century by the Spanish, St. Augustine is the oldest continuously occupied European settled city in the United States, sometimes nicknamed the ancient city. Her new desk stood inside City Hall, which shares space with a quirky museum of antiquities and high art inside the old 19th century Algazar Hotel, a Spanish Renaissance revival building capped with ornately carved terracotta and brick towers like a reverse red velvet layer cake. Jenny moved to St. Augustine during a spate of calm weather. For a handful of years, there were no major storms. She eventually moved alone to an apartment in a neighborhood called Davis Shores. It had been platted in the 1920s on Anastasia Island, a barrier island across the river from the city center. Jenny's place was a 1940s garage that had been transformed into a cottage. It was dainty and mint green with a metal roof, its inner walls covered in heart, pine, tongue, and groove paneling. She dearly loved this place, a space of her own. She planted three raised garden beds full of vegetables and adopted a puppy. But David Shores is low lying and susceptible to regular soaking by the tides. Already, even on a sunny day, a high tide could send water from the estuary into the creeks, to the storm drains, to the streets, dampening the underbellies of the cars parked there. Then St. Augustine's sea level rise report came back from the state of Florida and NOAA in June 2016 and offered an alarming prognosis for the city. With one and a half feet of sea level rise, nearly a third of the city's road network would frequently be swamped by the highest tides and small storms, and a fifth to half of the buildings and structures in the downtown historic district would flood around a once a month or so. In, sep in late September 2016, as if to illustrate how powerful and raucous water and wind could be, Hurricane Matthew rose up from the Caribbean. Um, and then there's a passage where I describe what happens in St. Augustine during the hurricane, but I'm going to skip over that for a second and just read to you Jenny's return after she evacuated and came back. On Saturday, Jenny drove her car back into the city under a jarringly blue sky. I was driving through, I don't want to say a war zone, but it felt like you're going to a site of devastation, she remembered. Downed fences, fallen trees and debris, signs wrenched off posts, 
Halloween pumpkins transported by floodwaters heaped on the street. At City Hall, although someone had piled sandbags in front of the doors, water had seeped through some windows on the side of the building, drenching a ground floor conference room and ruining the carpet and flooding. At the museum that shared the same building, it had flooded the hallway, the basement, and a historic pool that had been drained and was functioning as a cafe. Later that day, Jenny crossed the bridge, the Bridge of Lions, built in 1926 and adorned with actual marble lions, to her own neighborhood. When she arrived at her apartment, she saw that Matthew had swept up miscellaneous belongings from the yards and storage units nearby and strewn the alleyway in front with garments, outdoor furniture, and bicycles. The flood water had soaked the rooms inside her place, ruining her old wedding album, shoes, kitchen appliances, a dresser full of clothes, thumb drives, and various other personal effects she'd left there. Throughout the island, the wastewater system had overflowed, and the city warned residents to boil their water in case traces of human waste ended up in the tap. Her place emitted a powerful odor that she would remember vividly, but never be able to describe, stranger and more potent than sewage. After sizing up the mess, she donned rubber boots and gloves to salvage what she could of her home. In the next few weeks, she would turn her attention to the rest of the city to help other St. Augustinians recover to try to protect the place from the next flood. The storm wasn't as bad as it might have been, but it carried a more powerful symbolism than some of the hurricanes before it. It was a moment of foreshadowing that would force tough questions about the city's future and what everyone living there would do when the water arrived again and again at their doorsteps. Jenny would put her efforts toward helping the city she loved to stay safe for as long as possible. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, you. Yeah, and one of the things I love about the, the book is that the detail and the and the people and the just the, the daily dramas and um, in strength in the face of, you know, just devastation. I mean, to, to lose your home, to lose the, the things you love um, is, is so hard. And, what you know, as you alluded to at the end, part of um, I think Jenny's mission after this and and other floods too um, was to work with her community um, to you know to help other people recover and to you know she's a historic preservationist so to 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 save their things to save their albums to save the city's history their own history their community history mm -hmm. and I think that that seems to be a theme that comes again and again in this book that you found in your reporting. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different themes in there. I mean, one is this idea of stories, you know, that we have stories that connect us to a particular place. And history is really just that. It's just our collective stories that help us make sense of ourselves. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of places that are very historic, including Washington, D.C., that are at risk of major flooding from sea level rise and from storms um, already nearly every coastal city has had an increase in flooding events. Um, you and I were talking before the call about Annapolis, which is mentioned in the book, which has had a 925% increase in what's called nuisance flooding in the city in the last several decades. Um, and that's happening you know, in, in all sorts of places around the coast. Annapolis is a especially dramatic example, but it's, it's happening everywhere really. Um, but you know, there's, when we lose our homes, we lose, you know, when our homes are affected, there's the real estate part that's affected, but there's also the, the stories, the, the history, the meaning, the connection we have to a place and community that's at risk. And I think we need to be thinking more about that and talking about it. Um, and I think in a funny way, although we think of people being motivated by economics, mostly, you know, that they're motivated by losing their property, I think actually people are very motivated by losing the things that are personal and dear to them and by knowing that those things are at risk. And the people who are profiled in the book are people who are coming at it from that place. They really care very deeply about the place they live in. Um, Jenny actually eventually lost that apartment that she loved, that she lived in and moved to another space. but you know, her motivation for helping protect her community was not about 
her own personal space and finances. It was about the fact that she felt the place was valuable and rich in story and you know cultural heritage, and she wanted to protect that place. Yeah, and that's one of the one of the one of the things that's woven into the book is a kind of an understanding of of what home means and how that has to change, and, and just how fundamental it is. I think you pointed out, you know our um, world literature is full of stories of heroes defending their homes, protecting their homes. Um, it's, there's just something really core about that. And um, I think, so you, in addition to the book, um, which people ought to buy because it's delightful and really important, um, there are a couple of excerpts that you have out now. And I think um, one of the ones that's in the, in, there's an excerpt in the Atlantic that talks about some of the uh, kind of, you know, the emotion, the the personal connection, the, you know, what, what home even means and what, you know, different kinds of homesickness and uh, the, the the feelings that are evoked by threats to home. And so I definitely recommend that. And I, I think, um, oh yeah, thank you, Beth. Beth. Beth, just put that in the chat box. So do click on that link when you get a chance, if you're, if you're listening here, if you haven't read that yet. Thanks, Laura. Um, Sorry, I, I wondered if you're going to ask me something about. That. <laughs> <laughs> so I, just if you, I know you've got. There's a couple of other segments that that um, that we, we talked about that I that I think people will love to hear you read if if you're ready for the next one. Um. Well, I can. Yeah, I can give the other one is quite a bit smaller. Um. But I can give a little taste of it. Um. Let's see. Sorry. Um. Well, I'll, I'll read another little piece about St. Augustine, and it's, it's you know, this is less narrative and more kind of me philosophizing, which I do in various places throughout the book, but I think that it helps understand, like, where all these stories are leading um, and why I've put them in the book. So um, the city of St. Augustine has gone through a bunch of planning processes with the residents who live there, and um, some of it is about trying to find little tiny, you know, infrastructure fixes that will help buy places a little more time, address the weakest parts of the city that, the, that are the most flood vulnerable, and then also meet with neighborhoods and let them know what's going on so that they understand why the city is doing particular things and like um, are able to prepare themselves in their own homes. And so one of the people who works for the city who also appears in the book, um, Jessica Beach, she's a city engineer goes around neighborhood to neighborhood and has these conversations. And so I'm reflecting on those conversations and on what people were feeling in those conversations. It's a really little segment, but I just wanted to give you a taste of the questions. So this is people in St. Augustine. Some people were shocked by the flooding and planned to sell and depart. But some asked how to raise their houses. Some asked for help. Some had been there for generations. Some didn't want to leave. Some worried about their neighbors, elderly civil rights veterans, for instance, some of whom couldn't easily afford to go elsewhere. Families with roots back to the Spanish colonial era. Some developers and home buyers were moving west to higher ground, snatching up properties, sometimes at the lower income edge of the city, potentially pushing other residents out in the process. What will be saved? Who and what will get to relocate? Who will be left to fend for themselves? Will this be the usual game where money wins and displaces the people who lack it? Or will someone set up better rules, a clearer path out of the rising water, one that can lift most people to safety? St. Augustine has this, St. Augustine has decisions to make about what to do when all this water rushes in. These are the same decisions that every community along every coast will ultimately need to make. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, and th that's one of the points you make early, early in the story is uh, this quote from the introduction, we have to re-examine how to live. And the sooner we do that and the more seriously we take that question, the better chance there is to, to save some things, to, to make it a just transition. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's a hard truth. And you talk to people who've 
uh, who, you know, out of necessity, out of out of personal experience, they they have to, um, they, you know, they've been kind of forced to confront um, the the consequences of the climate crisis, and um, and that that they will have to change, uh, you know, that the, we'll have to reexamine how to live. Um, I think one of you know one of the points that that a lot of climate scientists make, and, and a lot of people in the in your book too, is that time makes a difference. Uh, if if we can just slow it down, that will give you know how you know, people a chance to you know raise their raise their houses, save their documents, um, you know, put in infrastructure that can you shunt water away from the most delicate historic buildings. Um, and that's, did you, when you, when you were talking to people for this book, did, did the sense of time, um, come up a lot and did people have a sense of just, you know, it, how urgent it is that, that we, that we work on climate? Yeah. Um, I think especially, um, in the communities that I talked with that are dealing with welfare, mm -hmm. really in any of the, all the communities that I talked with, but, um, um, I think wildfire is a particular kind of cri crisis that can just, you know, rush up and be very destructive, obviously, and you have to be ready for it. You have to be ready for it. Now you have to be ready for it every year. I mean, you probably always had to be ready for it every year in the West. It's just that I think in the past, um, people could rely more on the idea that firefighting alone and fire suppression, big campaigns of fire suppression could keep the fires in check. And that now we have a combination of things happening where um, where we have decades, you know, centuries in some cases of fires being fought in forests that normally would have had lots of little fires happening every year, and the fuel in Western forests has accumulated pretty dramatically in some places. At the same time that we have climate change happening and um, drying everything out, and um, making these hotter and so increasing the fire risk. And so, you know, we're in a situation where everything's primed for fire and communities that previously could more reliably fight fires have to be prepared for them just to come. They're gonna show up. You have to be ready, you know, to um, have your house be less flammable and, and create space around your house to, um, allow firefighting crews to get in there and defend it. So there is a, a very serious sense of urgency there. Um, I, I'm suddenly thinking that it might help for me to explain kind of the setup of the book because we're, we're I'm oh, jumping sure. suddenly floods to fires. <laughs> um, so the book um, has four narratives and it's divided into two sections. And in each of the four narratives, um, a community goes through a kind of crisis related to the climate crisis and realizes that they're in like a new world, which is sort of, in a, in a way, it's the classic story structure, right? The hero realizes they're in a new world. And that's really where we all are right now. We're realizing that we're in this new world that's being influenced by climate change. And then in the second part of the book, the community figures out how to deal with that challenge and, and ways to find solutions and find resilience. Um, and three of the stories are about communities that are dealing more with impacts of climate change, but there is also a frontline community in the Bay Area of California that's built around a refinery that goes through a refinery accident, actually is regularly going through refinery incidents, yeah. but they go through a very big one in 2012. And um, that forces a lot of questions about what does it mean to move beyond the oil economy? So those are the four stories. Mm -hmm. and so um, I was just talking about one in St. Augustine that's about flooding. And then there's one set in Okanagan County, Washington, which is in central Washington, which has gone through a series of um, really catastrophic wildfires, a huge one, um, largest on record in the state in 2014, and then another, another enormous one in 2015. And then of course the whole West Coast had those huge wildfires all up and down the coast in 2020. And um, you know, it is a wildfire prone place. So the area continues to get fires every year, but they're getting more and more extreme, more difficult to fight. Um, and people are having to think more concretely about how to be ready for wildfire. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the other two narratives, um, just in case people are like hanging on to be like, okay, what are the other ones? Um, so the, as you mentioned, the, the kind of climate justice 
um, you know, environmental racism story is uh, set in Richmond, California, uh, where the Chevron uh, refinery regularly um, poisons people. Uh, so that's one. And then um, after we talk about wildfires, I'd love to ask you some questions about uh, about your time in Alaska too, and because that's you, you know you went you did a lot of really really great reporting um, on climate refugees, basically people who had to to move their village. Um, and so those are the those are the four main um, storylines, and each one I mean, each one could be a book. So it, you know, it's like you get four books in one when you buy this. Book. <laughs> very rich. Um, but yet, but to go back to to firefighting, um, I think one of the firefighters uh, or one of the you know, fire experts you talked to um, said people need to accept the fact that no fire is not an option, and uh, that's a that's a hard thing to accept. That you know, fires fires are going to win, fires are going to come, we can't stop them. And um, so, yeah, do you want to tell us some more about about your experience um, talking to people who've who've been facing wildfires? And, and as you're doing that, Beth, if you don't mind, I think there's there's another link. There's an excerpt about wildfire um, that's in a magazine called High Country News. Uh, it's also another really excellent segment of the book for people who want to get a taste of it. So the person who said people need to rescue that no, sorry, people need to recognize that no fire is not an option um, was um, someone who's, who's both fought fires and he's a wildlife expert and he's also an expert on what's called prescribed fire um, and this is an interesting paradox of fire ecosystems and of living in the west is that um in order to have fewer severe fires you actually have to have more fires like but smaller ones um, and this is a an insight that indigenous communities knew have known still know for generations and many tribal communities, including the Colville Reservation in central Washington, have very active programs of prescribed fire. So this is a practice of setting deliberate fire on the landscape at a time when you can control it, like in the spring or sometimes in the fall, or you know, just other times of years when the condition you know, times of year when the conditions are right and you can bring fire onto the landscape. And it's part of the ecosystem, like all of the plants and trees and you know the landscape there is a, is adapted to fire. It's used to fire. To some degrees, it even wants fire. Like mm -hmm. some kinds of trees have cones, including um, you know sequoia trees will will set seeds out after a fire. Um, certain kinds of pines will go to seed after a fire, or you know like seeds will germinate after a fire more easily um so you know i i think i i bring in some of this because in the book because these are in, insights that came from indigenous communities but has, have also become part of science and science on fire management and have also become part of to some degree or are becoming part of the culture locally in some of these communities, at least among people who understand this. So the idea that you have to tend to the ecosystem around you and that that's a strategy for dealing with wildfire or dealing with anything really. I mean, dealing with any of the impacts of climate change, we have to tend to the ecosystems around us. Um, that's, that's a big part of the book as well. And um, I went out to areas in Okanagan County where I saw places that had been treated with prescribed fire and then had had um, a big wildfire come through. And it was really dramatic. Like the trees survived in a lot of those places. And it, you know, it looked like fire had just moved through low to the ground and had not killed a lot of things off when the wildfire came. Versus when you have areas that are that have not been managed that way, the fire becomes more intense, and then the communities around it are also at more at risk. So um, that was another insight that's in that part of the book. Oh, that's great. Yeah, sorry, I had a had a little hiccup in, in my connection. I'm not sure whose side it's on. It might be probably mine. Um, but yeah, it, so it, it, was there a reading that you wanted to share from the from the wildfire section of the book? Sure. Um, this is a bit of a different section. So I talk about that part of the ecological part of it. And then I also talk about the community level process of being ready for wildfires and being able to recover for wildfires. And um, 
I went out to Okanagan County to a little town called Taros, which is on the Columbia River. And um, that town has gone through a tremendous process of recovering from fire. A significant portion of the town burned down in 2014 during a catastrophic wildfire. And then um, a woman there named Carlene Anders, who had been a, has been a firefighter for, I think at this point, it's more than two decades. At that point, it was something like 17 seasons. Um, she led a massive local recovery effort, um, became the mayor for a number of years, and then um, she started an organization to lead recovery efforts across the county. And now she is consulting with lots of other communities. So she travels to communities around the country that are trying to recover from both wildfire and other kinds of disasters because the process is actually kind of similar. So this is, um, I went out there and met with her and she put together kind of a handmade, she and her her neighbors and community members have put together kind of a handmade feeling museum exhibit that was really beautiful about the fire. And she reflected to me about both the experience of going through it and about the experience of being ready for the next one. So let's see, let me find this. Okay, so she, she leads me through the town of Pateros and she um, points sorry, out Eric, how, how long after the fire. Oh, this is five, about five years. Five years, yeah. Yeah. And she said that even then they were still recovering. I mean, there are people who are still getting their lives back together and rebuilding. Um, but her organization actually built houses for people, um, people who had limited means, who had been uninsured in a lot of cases, who really had lost everything. They raised millions of dollars to help those folks rebuild. Um, so I'm walking with Carlene through downtown Pateros along the Columbia River. I couldn't observe any evidence of the wildfire, but Carlene gestured to the many things that had burned down and were now gone, as if conjuring ghosts. It was all on fire. You used to have trees and all kinds of stuff between the railroad tracks and the highway right there. We walked through a parking lot and followed a sidewalk made a stop at her office to collect some keys, then crossed a street to a retail building with a red metal roof and dark windows. It was temporarily a museum. She and her husband owned the building, she told me, and were planning eventually to open a restaurant there called Fire and Ice in recognition of Carlene's history as a firefighter and ski instructor. The name was also, as her mom would point out, an inadvertent Robert Frost illusion. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. When she opened the glass door and switched on the lights, we were facing a large square mirror mounted in a white wooden frame and propped against a cloth draped stool. Carlene grinned sheepishly as I took a photograph of our reflection. Hand painted across the mirror were the words, welcome to the smoke and reflections exhibit. The entire exhibit had a handmade feeling, laminated photographs pinned on black fabric, an image of a brick chimney still standing while the rest of the house it had belonged to was nothing but ash. An ATV so warped, it looked like folded cloth. Some images were donated by community members, including a local photographer. Some were Carleen's. A picture of a young woman and an older man clearing a yard full of ash beside a concrete wall. This is my daughter. This is the house that we built when I was young. This is my husband, she said, and gestured to the image. It occurred to me that she had been reciting these same details to people for years. Is it hard to keep telling this story, I asked? It depends. People told me that you had to tell the story eight to 12 times before you start to lose that emotional piece of it. And so telling a story probably helps, she said. Plus, there were reasons to keep reminding people. As she and I walked through the exhibit together, she worried aloud about the complacency that can set in even after a crisis. The problem is, five years down the road, are we still going to remember, she reflected. 
And it's going to get worse. There's no way it's not going to get worse. So we better be prepared, better do as much as we can while we can. I'm scared to death for the other side of the mountains. She looked at me meaningfully. The earthquake when it comes will be tough on everybody too. Be lots of fire then. The west side of the mountains, my side, has active and dangerous tectonic fault lines. And while the forests there are damper, they could certainly burn if warmer weather dried them out enough. Where do you live? Jasan, she said. I mumbled something about my house in Seattle, realizing I had no particularly solid plan for any of the situations she was alluding to. Nice. I love that she was concerned about about you and you know, <laughs> where do you live? Are you going to be okay? And, and it was also a very sobering moment for me. Like it really just kind of hit me in the gut. I was like, and not just my own risk, right? But hearing her story was very powerful to me. And then her reflecting it back to me and reminding me that I am also vulnerable it was just a very. It was a pretty emotional interview for me, actually. Yeah, that's a uh, amazing. I mean, she's an amazing person, and you know, firefighter. Um, you know, so she fought the fire. Her, her she has at least one kid who's a firefighter. I think too. Is that right? So daughter's daughter. a firefighter. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after the disaster, she helped people in her community rebuild or you know try to fight their way through the tangle of bureaucracy to to get some support and mm -hmm. and get new housing. Um, and then it, from, from what I remember, every town around her, when they would have a fire, the people would call Carlene and say, what do we do now? And so she just keeps helping, like her circle of people she helps just keeps growing and growing and growing. Yeah, absolutely. In 2015, there was another round of major wildfires to the north of Pateros um, called the Okanagan Complex Fire. And um, that was also huge and catastrophic and a lot of people lost homes. And there's a moment when um, she said everyone turned to ask, turned to her because she, she had done such a good job leading the recovery efforts in Pateros and said, you, you're going to lead this too, right? And she said, there was a moment when I felt physically sick, like, can I really do this? And then I thought, well, who else is going to do it? And so then she just kind of gathered herself and kept going. But, um, you know, just, just an, an amazing person really driven by love for her community and um I think you and I talked a little bit about hope when we were you know we were talking a little in advance for this conversation and I think people and people like Carlene definitely have hope but it comes from a different place than I think people often um talk about when they mean hope I don't think it comes from a place of thinking there's some guarantee of exactly what's going to happen in the world it comes from a place of thinking I love this place. I care about people. I, you know, I care about my family. I care about my community. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to try to protect people as much as I can. And really, everybody in this book is driven from that place, from a really strong place of kind of community-focused altruism, which I think is a, in a lot of ways a lot more resilient and a, a lot more powerful than just asking yourself, do I have hope that the federal government will do something specific about climate change or you know international policies will shake out a particular way um those things are important i mean yeah I, i'm not arguing that you know we shouldn't be putting pressure on our politicians we absolutely should and those are absolutely important but i think that there's also an incredible amount of power that happens when we come together in communities and ask ourselves how can we make decisions here about the climate crisis how can we make decisions here about both what kind of energy we use, you know, how, what our emissions are locally, what, you know, corporations like Chevron are doing in our community. And also like, how do we be prepared for this crisis? How do we help people withstand the impacts that are coming? Um, and, um, you know, I think that's something I reflect on a lot in the book. There's this scale where we can make a big difference that I think we are neglecting a lot of the time, which is that, we can make a big difference in communities. And there are a lot of communities doing incredibly positive, impressive, proactive work on climate change at every level. And I think that does make a difference. I think it makes a difference across the country. Um, and I think it's a scale that we ought to be paying more attention to.
Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's it's really inspiring. I think you're right. It's undercovered. Uh, it's empowering. You know, the, of, of course, you know, politicians need to act. Um, countries around the world need to do the right thing, control carbon emissions. Um, there's there's a lot that needs to be done at huge scale. Uh, but but the, the conversation is often just, you know, are governments going to do their thing or are you going to order a cheeseburger or not? <laughs> you know, it's, that's not fair. I mean, sure, there's a lot of reasons to think about what you individually can do, but but I, I just found it really inspiring to to be looking at how communities, uh, you know, it, it, facing such different specifics of the climate crisis, um, but are responding with you know creativity and cohesion and and experimenting. And when something works, they improve on it. And if it doesn't work, they try something else. Um, and it's, it's really inspiring to see that happening in real time under you know, really difficult conditions. I'll, I'll say one other thing about that. I think we're probably at, like question time, but just one of the people I reflect on in the book and one of the more essay like parts of the book is Eleanor Ostrom, who was a political scientist who, of course, won the Nobel Prize in economics before she died. And she studied um, sustainable systems for managing natural resources. And one of the things she found is that a sustainable system functions at many, many levels. And there's lots of overlapping authorities and lots of, of things happening everywhere <laughs> to sort of try to reinforce the rules and to try to create the system. And, um, you know, I think when we talk about these scales of only at the scale of federal or interna international policy or only at the scale of individual policy, we miss the fact that if we're going to create a sustainable system to manage climate change, it has to happen at every level, including at the level of the community. And I think oftentimes what happens in a community can also reverberate up. I mean, we have a lot of laws and policies at the federal level that come from what people decided to do individually. So. I think we have a lot of power in our in the places we live in and in our communities that we're maybe some of us are neglecting. And when we are searching for hope in the climate crisis, I think that's a place we can go. Like here's a here's another place where I can make a really big difference. Yeah, yeah, I love the Eleanor Ostrom um, section and and especially the way that you explained how her work and other researchers' work deconstructed the whole tragedy of the commons. Um, which is, you know, it's it's one of these terms, or one of these concepts that's kind of jumped from a, a field of research into pop culture in general, and it's just wrong. Like the tragedy of the commons was was like a made up situation with sheep farming. It 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 didn't happen, and it doesn't have to happen. And it doesn't <laughs> happen, and uh, and it's it's just you know, whether it's COVID or climate or anything else, like one of the challenges is is replacing like misinformation or faulty information with real information, and that's one of the, the things. That your book does really well. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we should switch to um, to 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 audience questions. Um, there's still plenty of time. You know, type your your questions into the Q and A box. Um, also, there's we've got some good ones already. And uh, oh, one of the ones from, is from Je Jenny Dushek. Thanks, Jenny, for coming. Uh, Jenny's also a, a science writer um, who lives in California. And she said, I, I love the way you talked about altruism, people uh, with people being driven by altruism and how that's different from hope. Um, but she wanted to talk about a different kind of uh, kind of drive or emotion or, or you know, response. She said, can you talk about the role of courage in climate work? Oh, wow. I know it's a big um, one. <laughs> Sorry, I should have. I didn't see any easy um, questions, but I thought that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is a really good one. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess to answer that question, one might start with what it is courage. Um, I think people think it sometimes think it's some kind of toughness, right? Like you're just, you're just like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, but it, but I think actually courage is facing uncertainty and risk and um, things that you're afraid of and moving forward anyway. So um, you hear a lot in sort of the polling about climate change um, that uh, people feel paralyzed, that you know they're moved toward fear. There's so much messaging about fear, about how we're all potentially doomed or something. Um, and you know, not to minimize the level of the crisis, but I think that kind of messaging is pretty unhelpful. Um, I think that the people in the communities that I reported on find courage, um, again, not from some kind of certainty and not from some kind of toughness. They're definitely all in touch with their own vulnerability and recognize 
their own, both their own emotional vulnerability, but then they're also personal vulnerability. I am vulnerable to this crisis. And the courage comes from knowing that and then going out into the world and saying, what do I do about this? What's right in front of me that I can take action on? And I think that's really important. And maybe that's something we need to be giving people when we're asking them to take action on the climate crisis is to acknowledge that it's scary and that it's, you know, and that it's hard, but that, you know, we can all be courageous to try to confront what's in front of us because of the other side that I've been talking about this, because we, we care about, there are things we love, there are things we want to protect. And I think that that is really motivating. I think in a lot of ways, it's more motivating than um, climate change is often framed as we need to be worried about this for our own survival. That's true. Of course, we need to be worried about our own risk. But I think people are often more motivated by thinking about the risk of the things that they care about and wanting to step up and protect those things. Oh, that's great. That that's that's a really powerful working definition of courage. Yeah, I love it. Uh, yes, we have some other good questions. One is um, one of the first ones that came in. It's it says it's evident that it's really important to tell these stories, um, humanize the climate crisis, show what's really happening in the world. And the question is, who do you think most needs to read this book? So um, when I thought about this book, um, I, sp I spent a fair bit of time reporting on uh, climate change public opinion. I've done a few stories on that. And um, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication has this series of reports it puts out dividing the American public into segments in terms of like who feels what way about climate change. And they have six segments and they run from, I'm not going to remember all of them exactly, but they, they run from people who are adamantly opposed to the idea that climate change is happening and are in denial about the situation and feel very strongly about that. All the, you know, all the way from people who are sort of a little bit indifferent, people who are concerned but don't really maybe quite, quite have a handle on it, to a segment called the alarmed. And the alarmed are the people who are the by far the most worried about climate change. They think it's personal, they think it's gonna affect them, they think it's gonna affect their communities, they're worried about their future. Um, and that segment has been growing really dramatically over the last few years. It's a really significant segment of the American population right now. However, when you start pulling and looking at who the alarmed are, a lot of them still feel really paralyzed. They don't know what to do about the climate crisis and they, um, you know, in a lot of cases, they haven't even really even been asked to do anything. <laughs> I think maybe because of this messaging that you're talking about, of either like pressure your politicians or like, you know, decide whether or not you're gonna recycle your soda can, which, you know, I, I, are kind of not always scales that I think are helpful to people. Um, I think this book is for that part of the alarm. So people who are really feeling this crisis and understand that it's real, but don't know what to do. I think reading these stories about people who are engaged with their community is, I mean, to me, it's inspiring and motivating. And I, I hope that, you know, for other people, it, it gives them a sense that there is something they can do where they live. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and so I, another question that might be a good follow-up to that, um, you know, you, 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 um, reported on four very different places with, with fighting different things. But the question is, are there good ways to prepare our communities for climate change? What can we do that will matter? And so kind of acknowledging that, of course, that, you know, what specifically you can do depends on where you live. But do you, mm -hmm. you know, did you extract some kind of general themes of, of what individuals can do to help um, to help build resilience in their communities? I mean, there's so many things. And of course, yes, it depends on what kind of risk you're taking. Risk, sorry, taking, facing. Um, I think maybe what I could offer is sort of a, a principle, um, which is just that, I mean, I'm perhaps I'm repeating myself, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it in a slightly different way. Like we, when people come together in communities, um, they have a lot more resilience together than they do individually. Um, and they have a lot more power together than they do individually. So for instance, there's a lot of research on social capital in a crisis like a heat wave, which probably most of us on this call have gone through some heat waves this summer. Um, so, I mean, heat waves are, of course are kind of a, 
a little bit of an undertold natural disaster. I think people do, people underestimate how bad they are, but there are often a lot more deaths in the heat wave than there are in a lot of other kinds of natural disasters. Um, and some of the research shows that if you go to communities that are really vulnerable, like communities with a lot of elderly, communities with a lot of lower income folks who don't necessarily have access to good air conditioning and ventilation and have hot old housing stock, those communities, of course, are going to be the most likely to have health problems during a uh, heat wave, right? But um, when those communities also have a lot of social cohesion, when they know their neighbors, basically, and check up on each other and make sure everybody is okay, then that, that disparity starts to go away. Like people who know their neighbors and check up on them, even when their neighbors are really vulnerable, do better during a heat wave, do, you know, do as well as communities that have tons of access to air conditioning in a lot of cases. Um, communities that you know, recover from a disaster easily often have a lot more community cohesion and social capital and people know their neighbors. Um, communities that prepare for disasters, like people know their neighbors. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence to show that, like, you know, there's some number of studies to show that when people have that kind of connectedness, they're more likely to have conversations about how do we get together and prepare. So instead of just, you know, buying your own like disaster kit and like bunkering down in your basement, like just having a conversation with your neighbors and with your community and with your community leaders about how are we getting ready for these things, I think can be really powerful and also really protective for everybody. Thanks. Oh, that's great. We have a lot of good questions. Um, so one of the questions is, is about your um, your experiences you know, as you were doing the reporting in these four main regions. Um, did it change your perspective on the climate crisis? Were there you know, realizations you came to that you weren't expecting? Any hypotheses that um, you know, that that were confirmed or or um, or challenged uh, as you were as you were in the process of of working on this book? Um. I think, I mean, I came, well, it's been a long process reporting to this book. Uh, this book. Um, I think a couple things. One is that it, I became more in touch with my own emotions and vulnerability on this subject um, because the reporting was so very immersive that I found myself feeling a lot of emotions as I was writing about communities going through these crises. And not that I actually know what it's like to, I, I have not lost my, home to wildfire, thank God, but like I had an, a sense, a, a piece of, you know, enough empathy to feel a piece of those feelings and to, to really internalize how vulnerable we all are. And I think that those feelings are valuable. I think we turn away from those kinds of feelings. And I think that maybe that's part of why we've been so slow to address this crisis. We're good at compartmentalizing or we're good at looking away. And I think getting yourself to look at something and notice what you're feeling and then take care of yourself, of course. But then also, um, I mean, how many social and political movements come out of collective outrage, come out of collective you know, concern about, about the future, about what people are experiencing, about um, noticing that other people are suffering and really feeling empathy for that. But those are the, that's the fodder for really the kinds of political will that we talk about needing to build in order to confront climate change. So I think that's one insight. Um, and I think, you know, I already went about this reporting feeling like I wanted to frame the climate crisis in terms of communities because I wanted people to be able to better understand how it impacts them at a scale that they could grapple with. But I think I also came away with just a powerful sense, a powerful sense that communities are powerful, like a, 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 a really gut level sense that communities can have an impact on this crisis. Um, we didn't get to talk a ton about Richmond, California, but that's a community where people have really come together, a community that's, you know, had a lot of other kinds of risks and vulnerabilities, a community that's dealt with a lot of economic vulnerabilities and like you said, you know, environmental discrimination. Um, 
And that community has been able to come together and say, we'd like to make some serious decisions about what a giant oil corporation can do in our city. And um, recognizing that they have power to ask those questions. And that was a revelation to me, I think, to realize that the communities have that level of power and influence. Yeah, and think about the the kind of the collective outrage um, that that kind of animated a lot of the work in Richmond. Uh, I think one of the one of the great quotes is, "Who owns the sky? You know, how can they take our sky from us um, when they're you know just just explosion after explosion spewing just ash and, and nastiness on people's you know, community gardens." Um, yeah, it's it, that was uh, I love that section. We didn't get to talk about that as much, or the or the um, the Alaska scenes, but uh, yeah, I hope people will read more about that. Um, we, let's see. Yeah, so this I think your last answer addressed one of the questions about the you know as, as you were writing the book, you know, it had to be kind of emotionally uh, challenging <laughs> to, to to be grappling with climate science. I mean, you know, the, the rest of us can can try to compartmentalize or intellectualize, but you were living it for years as you were working on this book. Um, do you have any advice for the rest of us about how to you know, how to think about climate in a um, in a way that's you know sustainable emotionally um, but activating? It's hard. It's you know, it's hard for me, even though I've I suppose I've become more practiced at it. Um I think, well, what I said, how you know, <laughs> like a community, yeah. having people you can talk about your emotions with. Um, I think naming them and you know, being real about the fact that they exist is helpful rather than just having this sort of existential dread floating around in the back of your mind. Um, that's one of the points that I make in the excerpt that ran in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, when we are able to say out loud that we're having these feelings and talk about them with other people. Um, that can be really healing. It can be strengthening to be able to do that. It's something that actually, in a sense, was said out of that excerpt that I just read by Carlene. She said that you have to keep telling the story. Yeah. We, when we talk about these things out loud and realize they're shared and we're not alone in them, then that's um, that helps build our both our individual and our collective emotional resilience. And part of that is um, is literally just creating or finding or sharing the words. Um, you know, there there are several words neologisms in the book that I, I had not come across before, and uh, but they capture. You know, it's like when you think, oh, there must be a German term that explains this. You know, really complex emotion, and and so people are creating like linguists are creating words to describe um, the, the feelings that that the climate crisis is bringing around and the, the challenge to home. Uh, is there a favorite word that you learned as you were as you were working on this book that you want to share with us? Hmm. Um, well, the obvious one, of course, and I, I didn't, um, I learned this, uh, well, I suppose you could say I learned it over the course of reporting this book. It depends on when you decide to find the start date of the book, because <laughs> I've been working on it a long time. But the word solastalgia is, and, and also a paired word, which is solophilia. So solastalgia is the idea that, um, coined by a, an Australian philosopher named Glenn Albrecht, the idea that we will experience a sense of homesickness and loss because the places that we live in and the places that are familiar to us become less recognizable because they're changing as a result of climate change or other kinds of environmental impacts. And then there's a related word, solophilia, which is kind of the other side of the coin which is the idea that um, when people are motivated to come together out of um, concern for the world, concern for places they love, concern for their community, um, they experience this sense of joy and relief and, um, and, and comfort that comes from that. And so those two words are kind of paired together in the book as a, you know, a difficult emotion and then a response to it. And that's great. So I think we're probably running out of time. Oh yeah, we'll go back to that. Hi, we are. Um, and I'm so sorry we are, because this has been like such a beautiful, um, hopeful conversation. Um, yeah, uh, thank you everybody for coming. I, I really would like to ask, um, because I have the privilege of the last word and I didn't run this by you all. Um, do you have a favorite piece other than this book at home on an unruly planet available at Politics and Prose? Do you have a favorite piece of like climate literature, nature literature, or kind of, um, 
literature about people in their environments and their communities that you'd like to share with us? Um, I think one of my favorite books about the climate crisis is Rising by Elizabeth Rush, um, which, you know, I felt like she and I were striving for similar kinds of ways to approach a climate crisis. It's something very personal, something very focused, something very grounded, and also very emotional. Um, of course, that book is mostly focused on sea level rise, but she also um, reflects a lot on environmental justice and climate justice in a way that's really powerful. And I, I just thought that book was really beautiful. Yeah, and a, a book that, that I thought about a lot when I was reading uh, Madeline's book is by Rebecca Solnit. Um, and let me get the title straight, A Paradise Built in Hell. Uh, and it's about the extraordinary communities uh, that come about in and after a disaster. And it's it's another one of these things where the there's this kind of pop culture idea that people turn into, you know, animals, vicious monsters who will, you know, eat each other limb for limb when there's a disaster. It's not the case. People come together. They help one another. I mean, it's terrible when it's a disaster that causes it to happen, but um, but it has some really, really inspiring examples of, pe of people being their best selves when they need to help others. I love that. That book was also really an, an inspiration to me, so I'm glad you mentioned it. Excellent. Um, well, thank you both. Uh, thank you to our audience for these excellent questions tonight um, and for participating and for, um, you know, uh, hopefully going to our website and buying the book or even um, popping by any of our stores in person. Um, your patronage is, again, what allows us to have community programming like this and get messages like this, um, the one in this book out to, uh, to everybody, not just in DC, but all around in this virtual format. Um, be sure to, while you're on our website purchasing your copy of the book, check out the other events that we have coming up. Um, we have some great ones in August and September. Um, and uh, thank you again to Madeline Ostrander and Laura Helmuth for this beautiful conversation tonight. Um, to everybody out there, stay well and stay well read. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Bye. Bye.